Good morning. Happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand. And it is perfect. Okay. Monday. Big week coming up. And the Q&A for today is going to be very philosophical. So I'll give you a warning that if you don't want to understand the philosophy behind the model, you're not concerned about that, then don't watch it. Go watch something else. Go watch somebody working out on video or something like that. This will probably get all of maybe five or six views on YouTube as well. Um, but I think it's a really, really good question because it's from my buddy Ed in Germany. And Ed asks really good questions. And I think that if you are interested in how the model evolves, then it might be a little bit useful for your discussion um, later on with other folks that, that are having trouble absorbing it. So... Let's dive right into this question. So Ed says, uh, the model of inhalation and exhalation works, and it is to your credit to show uh, simple solutions uh, to put the human body into positions and facilitate the desired outcome and to restore normal breathing mechanics and movement options. But I think we have to acknowledge that it's not only a body or body part position that influences the mechanics of movement, posture, but also neurological in and output. And then he goes on to sort of express a number of ways that we can manipulate senses and, and gain movement related changes and finishes with uh, shouldn't we incorporate neurology of sensing and the effect of autonomic states into your model and so ed I, I would offer that that the model actually does take all of those things into consideration they're just not always expressed for various reasons so let's get into that the goal of the model first and foremost is to be coherent and so rather than coming up with with um, uh, explanations that, that may be overly complex, what we want to do is we want to be coherent with the, with the rules and laws of the physical world, or we can even talk about the universe. So um, when we talk about, about movement in general, uh, you have expressed that, that you think the model is about inhalation and exhalation, and I would offer that this is a gradient based models. When we talk about any movement in the universe, it requires a gradient to move. So whether we're talking about planets moving through space or rockets moving through the air or human movement or cellular processes, all of these things require a gradient. So if there's no gradient, there's no movement. So let me give you a for instance. So I have a pen here. This pen is affected by gravity. If I hold the pen here, it has a certain amount of energy. If I raise it up higher, I've increased the potential energy that this pen now has. So what gravity is, is an energy gradient. So the higher I lift something, and then as I release it, I just moved it from a, high, a higher energy level to a lower energy level by dropping the pen, by releasing that potential energy as kinetic energy. And so for us to move through space, we have to do so through gradients out of respect for the physical laws of the universe. And so now we have to respect the fact that we have to be able to orient in space, we have to perceive that space around us, and then we have to manipulate, manipulate that space to achieve the desired outcome. And so what the sensory inputs provide us is information about that space, and then every physiological subsystem in the body will respond and contribute to a solution or an output that emerges. So, so let's pick on a sensory input that may be the most powerful or at least the best studied is that we talk about vision. And so, so vision uses compression and expansion just like we do when we think about the, the, the physical movement. So, so vision actually expands space. We use ambient vision where we, where we spread our vision out or we bring it back into focal vision and compress that space. Um, so it uses the same rules. Hearing does the same thing. So it compresses and expands space to help us actually determine what our environment actually is. Touch is very, very similar in that, in that regard. And then again, physiology responds through the manipulation of gradients. So this would include all of the senses that respond to a sensory input. And then we have the autonomic nervous system that, that would respond as well, which behaves on a gradient. So there, the gradient of the autonomic nervous system is flight or fight to, to rest and digest. And we'll be somewhere along on that continuum as well. And so all of these subsystems Inter interact and they produce an emergent output as a solution. So the model does consider all of these, these systems. You manipulate any one of these subsystems to a sufficient degree and you can change the emergent output. The goal then would be to determine which subsystem is most rigid or least adaptable and then favorably influence that system to produce the desired outcome. But 
in the environment that I work in and the limitation of my scope of practice limits what I can actually measure. So thankfully, movement capabilities is a useful proxy measure for the interaction of many, if not all of these subsystems. Um, so I also get the benefit of movement feeding back into the system and affecting all of these other subsystems as well. So movement becomes this really, really powerful uh, aspect that I can actually measure and then utilize as the intervention to influence any number of things that I can't measure. So whether we're talking about pain or a movement restriction, or we're talking about psychological disorders and chronic disease, movement becomes this, this really, really powerful solution. So I don't express these concepts very much, um, mainly because I don't measure them. You know, so I can't tell you where you fall on the autonomic uh, gradient. I can't, I can't measure your blood pH in real time to determine what your, your other physiological needs might be. So again, I just don't discuss these things. But what I do measure is movement. And I, what I do try to influence is movement. So I spend my time uh, basically talking about that. And so if we move through compression expansion, we move through creating a gradient of pressures and volumes, then that's where the discussion should lie for a, a, a movement professional like myself. It's like we can discuss all these other cool influences and by all means study them to, you, to your heart's content, gain as much depth as you can. I spend time doing that as well, but in the end, I'm a movement guy and my goal is to create a model that is coherent with the physical laws and to measure the things that I can and influence the things that I can. So, so Ed, I don't want you to think that I've ever ignored any of those things. Um, and, but, I, but again, I just don't discuss them because again, this, it's not a way that I can determine a, a useful outcome and, and create uh, the, 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 the situations that, um, that I'm looking to create in the purple room or wherever I might be, whether I'm maybe in the, in the training hall as well. So hopefully, Ed, that gives you a little bit of, a, of an understanding of, of where I'm coming from. Great question. Glad you asked it. Glad I got to express a couple of things. Apologize for rambling as usually, usual rather. And so everybody have a great Monday and I will see you tomorrow.